Hello, and welcome to MIT's Open Documentary Lab and Co-Creation Studio. I'm William Uricchio, Professor of Comparative Media Studies at uh, MIT and founder and principal investigator of the Open Doc Lab. And today we'll have our second conversation in the Layers of Place series about augmenting public space in order to reframe and reveal the stories of place. The focus of today's session is about inclusivity, collaboration, bridge building, the dialogic, reconciling the realities of public space with imagination and the desire for something better. If you joined us for part one, you'll know that I made the case uh, for why documentary is engaged with augmentation. Documentaries at their best help us to see more clearly and more critically. They help to expand our experience of the world and sometimes even help us to change it. The many augmentation strategies that we looked at last week offer distinctive approaches to documentary. They offer ways to scratch indications and stories onto the surface of the world. They allow us to go beyond representing our relationship with actuality and to engage with it directly. Many of the technologies involved are accessible, opening the way for far more of us to participate than has typically been the case. And best of all, these annotations and marks and sounds are additive, not mutually exclusive. They enable multiple points of view, they encourage polyvocality, and key to today's discussion, they are dialogic. Augmentation always entails a dialogue between the mark and the thing marked, between the sign and the world. But given the potentials for widespread participation and for marks and signs to accrete and coexist, they also enable complexity, sharing, and dialogue. We live in divisive times, one of the fruits of systematic inequity and injustice. How can annotation be part of the cure and not just more fuel for the fire? How can these developments fit with our contradictory and some, sometimes exclusionary notions of public space and with our far too often fractured communities? Perhaps more importantly, how can augmentation help us to see more clearly and critically? Can it be used in ways that offer hope, offering us, uh, helping us to feel histories and experiences that bind us together as communities and as a species? Some important questions. And uh, before we turn to today's panel to find out, two last things. First, a big thanks to our sponsors, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and MIT's Transmedia Story Initiative, and to our partners, Magnum, Centrofi, and the International Documentary Festival Amsterdam's Doc Lab. And second, a shout out to our team, the wonderful, our wonderful research assistant, Ambar Reyes Lopez, our producer, Claudia Romano and ODL's director, Sarah Wallison. They make having events like this a real pleasure to participate in. I would now like to introduce Benjamin Stokes, who will moderate today's session. Ben is the founder of the Playful Cities Lab at American University, and you can find his and the bios of the other speakers in the chat. Ben. Welcome. It's so great to be here and to be part of this conversation. I'm really excited to be moderating uh, this conversation across disciplines, partly because I think that the one of the most important and hardest challenges for the future of augmentation and documentary as it becomes a little more interactive in community and in place is how we connect across disciplines, uh, co-design with communities and bring together areas like urban planning, um, art, uh, and even an area like game design, um, that's, that's where I come from. Uh, my background is in uh, game design and, and game studies. I helped start an organization called uh, Games for Change uh, a while ago. But, but I think that one thing I've learned is that um, as uh, we, we take documentary in the direction of, uh, of layered place and layered meaning, we move from having writing the story once to the layers of place and the layers of narrative that require this kind of co-construction uh, and dialogue. So I, I love that dialogue was what was just invoked. And I think that will be part of our conversation today. To start our conversation, I wanted to just uh, highlight a couple of the speakers. You're gonna hear more from them and we're gonna, do, we're gonna bring them in in kind of a layered way as well. Um, so our speakers can bring on their cameras. Uh, we have Carla Bishop, a filmmaker and professor in digital storytelling. 
Lafayette Cruz, an urban planner and futurist who leverages the radical imagination. Raphael Luzana Hemmer, a media artist at the intersection of architecture and performance art. And Shea Rivera Rios, an artist and cultural strategist. All of our panelists, of course, bring many more than just those few bits that you've heard. And I think you'll start seeing some of that in the conversation today, but I wanted just to uh, give you a, a sample of where, where they're coming from. Um, and I think then also to bring in their voices, why don't I turn it to each of them and invoke place um, to, to hear just a little of, of either where they are focused, where they uh, do some of their, their work, or even just where you're based today. So Carla, could I turn it over to you? Could you help uh, bring us to a place? Yes, right now I am based in Phoenix, Arizona, um, but my body of work focuses on um, historically black communities across the entire United States. So I'm jumping around and, and just studying these black towns all across the country. Yeah. Thank you. And Lafayette, help us with a place. Yeah, so I, for most of the pandemic, I've been based in Southeast Wisconsin and Racine, but my work is focused on anywhere there's communities of marginality um, who are imagining different futures. Raphael, how about you? I'm uh, in Montreal, Canada, uh, though I'm a Mexican. I migrated here a while back and uh, most of my work takes place either as a nerd in digital spaces. So uh, that's a space I spend a lot of time in. And finally, Shay. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm based in Providence, Rhode Island, Narragansett and Wampanoag land. And yeah, my work is very hyper-local, but I cultivate transnational relationships too. And like Rafael, I'm a nerd and love the digital realm and how we can use that to amplify community voices. Wonderful. So you've heard just a little sampling of their voices. In terms of our approach for this panel today, we're going to have each of them give a five to seven minute profile of some of their work, um, some amazing videos uh, about different places uh, and community-based augmentation, documentary, uh, social practice. There's, there's a lot of different pieces you're going to see and that will help provide a little concreteness to anchor this conversation. And then from there, we're going to move into a conversation across the work that people have introduced. We'll also start taking questions from the audience. Those questions can come in as you're hearing them, feel free to suggest them. Uh, and if you uh, officially submit a question through the Q&A, that may be the easiest way to make sure it isn't lost in the chat. Things can sometimes scroll by in the chat and then we can come back to them. We welcome the, the questions as they unfold. Um, oh, I, I should add uh, so that I, I'm also uh, not just subjecting the, the panelists to this question in terms of place, uh, I'm based in Washington, DC. Uh, which I actually chose partly for its interesting tensions between the national and global and the local. Um, and so I think that this is a, a tension a lot of us feel at a time when we can publish media online to wider and wider audiences. There's a question of when do we need to be more and more tied to place uh, and to the local. So I think that that's going to come up in, in our conversation as well. Uh, in contrast to this, the panel that was uh, the first part of this two part, one word that I'm going to keep bringing us back to is community. Um, this is in the title of our, of our focus. It's also in a, 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 an area that I think each of us is really interested in. And so the question of how do we, uh, to what community uh, are we connecting? Are we accountable? Um, are, are we working with? Uh, is is a, a, a twist on, on how we often think about media, um, which is delivered to an individual, um, to, a, to a viewer, um, or consumer. Um, and so I think that that's a, a preview of some of uh, the, the recurring theme that we'll take in this session today. Um, to, to kick us off, what, why don't we, again, go back to the concrete uh, to see some actual work. Maybe I'll ask Carla um, to uh, show, tell us a little about your practice and work um, around digital storytelling. Absolutely. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, I'm going to go and share my screen and show you some of my um, projects while I talk about it. So give me one second. Um, share. Okay. 
Um, can you guys see my screen okay? Is that, uh, so I love the thought about community and, and uh, the basis of all my work deals with ways of using media to bring communities together. I firmly, firmly believe in using like films and even screenings in theaters or outdoor screenings as a way to bridge communities. And I'll talk about that in one of the projects I did um, in North Texas. Um, before I jump to that, I want to talk about even um, some of the earlier projects I've done. Um, my body of work, the, the focus of it is documenting historically Black communities. And I've worked on um, intergenerational documentaries where youth interview elders in their communities and create a feature length documentaries about these towns. And this is an image where we had a red carpet premiere that brought the community together. So we rented out space in a hotel, had everyone from the neighborhood dress up and they were able to watch themselves on the big screen. So a big part of what I do is to bring people together around these different types of media. Um, and this is just some of the Q&A and, and discussion that came from the panel after the screening. So that's also a big part of my process in bringing people together. Um, and this leads into a project that I'm really proud of called Freeman Town 2.0, which was an interactive augmented reality documentary that um, I produced in North Texas, working with college students and community members in this area called Southeast Denton, which is a historically black community in North Texas. Um, this project, I worked with students at the University of North Texas, and we framed this project as a, I guess, problem-based project and also using some of the design thinking processes in terms of coming up with a problem or figuring out where there was a problem and figuring out how we could use media as a solution. So we created this class and we, we framed it around this um, question of how to use interactive documentaries to um, document the history of Denton's Black communities that educate, celebrate, inspire, and engage multiple generations in the Southeast Denton community in North Texas. So our main goal was to preserve a history um, of this Black community, which wasn't fully written about from the perspectives of the members of that community. And our solution was an AR documentary because we wanted to engage youth and elders and in between to, to make this history digestible and interactive and accessible and, and not in just a traditional linear documentary form. So that was a big part of this project. Um, as I said before, we used the design thinking process where we did a lot of research, we had to define the problem, and we did a lot of prototyping, prototyping and ideations of what this was to look like. And I'll show you some of those examples. Oops, what happened? There we go. Um, so the first part in terms of just design thinking, we um, researched the area. So my students went into the community and we asked members of that community, what stories do you want preserved and documented? So these are some of my students who were at a local senior center and they were interviewing some of the elders and just asking them like, what history is missing from the history books? Um, we did a lot of research in the libraries and went to local archives to also see what was already written so we can know like what was missing. Um, the next part is then we tie this to an augmented reality application. Um, at the time, we used an open sourced um, app, and, and you know there, there's different versions of this out there now. But with our AR documentary, we wanted to do two things. We wanted it to be image based, where if you hold up your mobile device to an image, a video will pop up telling the history of that image, but also location based. So if you're walking around the neighborhood and you're you approach a historically a historically black church, you can hold up your cell phone and the history of that church will come up based on what the community members said about that church. So we had digital overlays on top of this physical world to augment these spaces using video, photos, music. Um, and then our first trial run, we used um, a group of students. I'm so sorry, my dog is very um, hyper right now. But um, we worked with a group of students at the Martin Luther King Rec Center. And we, we, we did a trial run of our AR documentary where we had different location points throughout the community. And students had tablets where they would go up to these different spaces and, and learn about the history. This is a map that we used where they were going to different parts of this community. And just to give you guys some examples, for example, in this area of Quakertown, this was a historically black area in North Texas that was um, forcibly migrated to the southeast part of town um, in the early 1920s. So each of these X's represents different historical landmarks and points where the students were able to interact with videos and learn about that history of like the first black doctor, grocery stores and businesses in this area. Um, the next part, after we did the, um, the, the digital scavenger hunt, I'm going to pause this really quick. Um, we decided how else can we get this 
to pe members of, of the community because I know that not everyone was able to walk around the whole town and interact with these videos. So we decided to bring everything to one space and we created an interactive gallery and I'll go back a little bit where we printed pictures of community members and locations and use those as trigger images. So if you hold your cell phone or tablet up to these images, the stories of these individuals in these spaces would um, come up on your device. And they were like short one to two minute stories. We had between maybe around 40 to 50 different interactive images throughout this gallery space. And we brought a lot of the community out to um, share with this, with the, the history here. And this is one example. Um, we also realized that even with this, the interactive nature of AR made it hard for everyone to experience the videos in their entirety. So the next part of using this to bring people together is we had an outdoor community screening, and I'll just share this briefly, where we brought people together to screen it in a local park in this community so they could see themselves on a large screen and see the history, but also having that interactive component where we did have a digital scavenger hunt within the park with different location markers for kids and activities and things like that. So this is part of the screening and some of the community members that came out, we had games. And again, centering around using media as a way to bring people together. And, um, and food, I'm, I'm a big proponent of food, bringing, you know, using food to bring people together as well. And that's some of the scavenger hunt. Um, the last part of, I guess the last, the next phase and kind of what I, where I'll wrap it up at is after we had that community screening, a lot of members asked, okay, when's the next one? When can we have another outdoor screening to come together? And we realized all, you know, creating new documentaries every year became time consuming. So we also went back to the old school way of just using film as entertainment. And we showed a film in the park and we showed The Last Dragon, if anyone's familiar with the 1984 cult classic with um, Bruce Leroy and Shonuff. And we used um, AR as a way to create an interactive space for the community where my students created AR um, glasses and hats from Bruce Leroy and using different filters and whatnot. So we had a, out, another outdoor screening that we um, tried to make more of an annual thing where we brought community members together with, again, with the food and students having just different activities, again, to bring people together and promote um, community engagement. Um, trying to see how am I on time? Trying to make sure I'm not going too much over. Um, so that the, and we also created like a short documentary before the film that also enhanced that screening. Um, and then to kind of just end on um, where this work has taken me, what I'm realizing is that there's so much history out there that's hard to just encapsulate in these one-off interactive screenings and whatnot. So in the, at the moment, I'm creating an interactive archive of these Black communities where it's accessible on a web-based or mobile app to um, basically click on a map and continue to learn about these stories and archive them in a way that's um, accessible to um, just larger communities. So that is... Wow, that was a lot. So um, I guess is that, am I pretty much at time now? Cause I can always, yeah, think. So yeah, so that's kind of where I'll wrap it up now. Um, for now and then I guess we'll kick it off to the next panelist and then we'll, we'll kind of circle back around. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Carla. That's um, such a rich set of examples. And I think that just one quick observation as, as we transition is this is not, the form changes so much. It's not just as, like you'd go and see, oh, this is what a documentary looks like at a film festival. Wow. Um, you have so many different forms. And especially when you go into community um, and want to, to sustain over time, you're almost uh, forced into conversation with different forms, different media, different voices, different layers of history. So layers, as per the title, this is really something that is at the at the center, uh, not just something we work around. Um, so thank you for showing showing that. And we'll come back to some of the examples you mentioned. Lafayette, do you have uh, so tell us a little about your work? Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. I'll pull up my slides as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone. Um, as said before, I'm uh, an urban planner and a futurist. Um, worked with organizations like the Guild of Future Architects as a writer and facilitator, currently working as an art strategist um, for this organization, AI for the People. But um, today I wanted to talk about this longer term project I've been working on with some friends and collaborators called Musings from the Margins of a Polychrome Future. Um, 
and this really emerged from like my professional my young professional life as a transportation planner for a regional planning for the regional planning agency in Chicago and my love for science fiction and fantasy um and before I move forward I want to read this Walter Mosley quote where he says only form of fiction that I know of that is truly revolutionary is science fiction and speculative fiction not only is it revolutionary to mean to say it overthrows a way of thinking it also puts pressure on you to figure out what are you going to do now that you're here and you know as i spent my career or i keep saying career my early my early career um working regional planning i just became frustrated with the constraints on imagination um working in transportation planning everyone only wanted highways or when we have large urban issues when you propose a solution you're told well that's not possible um and yet i was making plans for highways and roads and infrastructure that will be built in 50 60 70 years and realized like a lot can change in that time if we imagine it differently and similarly the expectations that people were bringing for me as a planner to build were very constrained um and also very much informed by the speculative media that they've seen. So I would get a lot of questions about self-driving cars because Elon Musk has said it or because they've seen Minority Report. And the frustration with the imagination sort of in both realms made me realize that it comes to the sort of thesis that urban planning is a form of speculative fiction. Both of those, like the future, nothing is set, um, but with both fields of popular narratives and popular constraints and popular bounds are often dictated by straight white men in America. And so it limits what we see as legitimate planning and what we see as legitimate speculative fiction. Um, and when I first started this work, being an urban planner, being a black man, a lot of people were like, oh, you wanna do like San Francisco or like Wakanda. Um, and these sort of like big, very directly city-based projects. Um, and for me, I was like, well, no, there are more subtle ways in which our popular media affects what we expect in our communities. Gone with the Wind is a highly popular speculative fiction of the past, and it's shaped many people's perception of the history of our country and thus the trajectory of our country. Or even Yellow Peril's fiction has shaped our national understanding of our relationship to Asian countries and Asian Americans. And so that allowed the general public and planners to feel good about building highways through mixed race and black and Latino communities. Um, it made the sort of physical structure of our community seem like a plausible and the most rational way forward. Um, and I found that frustrating and I found it subtle and insidious, um, but I also appreciated my world in long-term planning and my world in speculative fiction helped me realize the ways in which we can flatten time and that it's not linear in the same way that we're living in the cities that were imagined in the past, we are currently imagining the cities of the future and the cities of the future living in the imaginations of today. And so I created Musings from the Margins of a Polygram Future. Um, it was meant to be a space where we collected or gathered urban planners, architects, designers, artists, activists around a dinner table. I'm, like Carla, I think food just makes everything better. Um, and, we sort, and we basically said, you as people who sit in marginalized community, but also in spaces of change and imagination. Often we spend our time making sure that our histories aren't, that we're not erased from history and that we're not displaced from the present, that we don't get enough time to really sit and intentionally imagine more and see our imagination and our aspirations as legitimate, legitimate forms of planning, a legitimate path forward. Um, as a like drawing of all Z fan, I like to say it was a bit of a hyperbolic time chamber where we flattened the past, the present, and the future and guided and guided people in trying to detach from the constraints of today. Um, to imagine in a world in the future in which we've won, the battles that we're fighting, 
we won. We're not, we're, our marginal identities today are not marginal anymore. What are we, do, what is our community doing? What are our questions? What are, who's else, who else is with us? What does it feel like? What are the cities we're operating around looking like? And so it initially started as conversation, well, it initially started as my thesis in grad school and then these conversations and we've continued to build from there. So writing, um, speculative fiction, uh, I don't know, sorry. Uh, writing speculative fiction, creating art, adding more creative media that is very much based in place so that as we continue to go forward, as we continue to plant these seeds, as they continue to grow, when an urban planner hears some, hears a rap about the future in the community, they can understand that as, oh, this is civic engagement and this is someone saying, this is what they want from the community. Um, when we, one of the things I've been proposing is like capping highways. When someone puts that forward, because it is in the collective imagination, we can see it as a possibility. We can see it doesn't have to happen now, but we can work towards that. Um, and so, yeah, we are moving forward with this and iterating sort of what are the different media representing the speculative world of our conversations. Um, but yeah, we're just we can continue moving forward, just creating these spaces of demarginalizing, imagining a future where marginalized voices of today get to dictate the vibrancy, the openness of a future that we can't have. Um, but yeah, I'm going to end with this quote as well from Adrian Marie Brown. Um, we see ourselves as part of a growing wave of folks connecting science fiction, or what we're calling visionary fiction, with social justice. Science fiction is perfect in exploring ground as is a perfect exploring ground as it gives us the opportunity to play with different outcomes and strategies before we have to deal with the real world costs. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to more discussion about our, our work and community. Thank you so much, Lafayette, and for bringing the future into our, our present. Um, that's, I think, a layer that becomes um, it's so natural for urban planning to think a little about the future because you're making decisions about where we'll, we'll go next. Um, and, and I think that uh, so often with documentary, we also look at the past um, and how do we create room for the, the future and the past at the same time is such an, an interesting challenge that uh, at one point was speculative, but I think that we're starting to see that this is a, a, an immediate concern. Uh, we have to talk about the future and the past uh, at, at the same time as we start working more in community and augmenting at, kind of in, in real time. Um, Raphael Lozana Hammer does work in, in real time uh, as well. And why don't we turn a little and see a little about one of your projects. Thank you so much. Um, I'm an artist who works with a team of uh, developers in uh, my studio here in Montreal. And uh, often about half of our production is to um, takes place in public space at a time of intense divisiveness and discussion of uh, a wall that would separate the US and Mexico, the studio uh, was interested in making an intervention alongside the long tradition of interventions across the US-Mexico border. So what I'm gonna share is a project called Border Tuner. It's a project which took over, um, uh, it was um, over, two, over two nights across the uh, El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua border. We wanted to create this massive bridges of light that will bring the communities together. So um, I did about eight scouting trips to the area. I met with local stakeholders. I understood that the ideas that I came with were completely wrong. What they wanted is not to talk so much about the wall itself and the divisiveness and all of the narrative, the dominant narratives of fear, but rather about the things that connected already these two communities. It's, they're basically sister cities. If you don't know, um, El Paso and Juarez, they're basically the largest uh, binational community or metropolis in the Western Hemisphere. 
And the, pro the project is designed along six stations, three in Mexico on the south and three in the United States in the area called El Chamizal, which was kind of like a meandering part of the river, which was a binational area for many years. And the idea is that each one of these interactive stations allowed you to control massive searchlights that would um, be seen from a 15 kilometer radius. So this is actually the, the urban sprawl of El Paso and Juarez. Of course, this urban sprawl existed even 100 years before the United States existed, El Paso del Norte. And now, um, especially after Trump, the, the wall has been supersized as this sort of symbolic wedge uh, across the two um, communities that have uh, lived in coexistence for hundreds of years. So the interface is basically a wheel, like a tuning device, something that allows you to, um, as you turn this wheel, the searchlights that are right on the station you're controlling, they're actually scanning the horizon. And when your lights, say in the US and my lights in Mexico, intersect in midair, the computer automatically opens a bi-directional channel of communication so that we can speak to each other. And of course, if I don't like what you're saying, I could just tune you out and go tune somebody else. Okay. So these are examples of, uh, of the participation of the people. Over the course of these uh, two weeks, we got 10,000 um, people coming together in the artwork, um, mostly to speak to people that they could not see. They could only um, hear their participation through this system. And um, it was quite a bipolar project. It was a project where um, families, for example, that were separated would get together and it would be a very emotional moment. There was a lot of singing and serenading, a lot of uh, flirting, a lot of people just uh, tuning into each other's reality. Um, the place where this project um, took place uh, happened is basically like a continuous landscape. So when you're standing in Mexico, you can just see the continuity into the mountains of Texas in the back and vice versa. And uh, the communities, of course, you know, 70% of the people in one side have family members on the other side. Um, and so it's a very, you know, sort of close relationship. Y eso porque ha dejado de visitar Ciudad Juárez? Por temor. ¿Tiene familiares aquí? Sí, allá tengo bastantes familiares. ¿Y si viene seguido para acá? Ah, por el temor a Walmart, lo que pasó. Yo tengo a mi madre y a mi hermano allá. Años sin vernos. Por el motivo de pasar acá no puede venir o por temor a lo que ha estado sucediendo. Um, ellos también por eso no vienen, por temor. So, um... Throughout um, the nights, we had historians and poets and feminist rappers and indigenous communities speak through um, the microphones, meet each other. Um, usually they were speaking Spanish. A lot of people were uh, speaking English, but we also had Ende, Antigua, and Ramuri, um, the local indigenous community speaking through. Some of it, as I was saying, was very emotional, but other stuff that we saw is people flirting uh you know like an 18 year old woman would say to the guy in the us have you ever been to mexico he says no why well because i'm afraid well i'll show you around and then the friends ask well how old are you and he says i'm 20 and then the friends all get happy well she's 18 and then they exchange facebook messages so just creating a continuity out of this session is what what we wanted to um to make happen and so um, the project um, responds mostly to, to new narratives. So the narratives, not the dominant narratives of violence and, and, um, and racism, but the, the narrative that emerges out of the interaction of people. So many new voices were heard through this piece or voices that need to be amplified. This is, for example, a veteran of war that fought for the United States in Vietnam and was deported. Um, you had, uh, uh, 
you know, a, a very large number of, of surprises. Like, for example, this is the, the Republican mayor of El Paso um, talking about how El Paso is uh, and has always been a safer city because of the economic relationship to Mexico, because of all of the interconnections that were already existing between them. And he stood up to Trump, which was a really refreshing thing to see. Um, he basically said, no, Mr. President, El Paso has been a safe city for 30 years before the wall arrived. Um, and, uh, and that's not easy to see uh, when uh, people stand up to speak about complexity as something that needs to be defended. Um, as I said, uh, the initial, every night when the project started, we brought in um, either performers or musicians or poets or historians, or we had an LGBTQ night and so on. And the idea was to have like 35 minutes for these voices to um, take over the, the night sky. And then we'd open the microphones for the general public. And so these are, uh, this is the, the wheel just turning and then as you turn it you are scanning the horizon and like i said one of the main things about this project is not so much that your voice is amplified but it's your hearing that is amplified because it is only when the lights intersect that you can hear this person and if if they are not being collaborative or they're being annoying or whatever you can just tune them out and look for another channel of conversation across the area the important thing is to um, create artworks that are out of my control. The project was entirely supported by philanthropic organizations in the US and Mexico. So there was no advertising, there were no government grants, it was all the civic uh, platform to have this kind of interaction across the border. Um, there's a great architect, Ronald Rael in, in California, who um, speaks about a border that is not there to divide us, but as a place of encounter, a place where we can come together. And I'm very much believing in that idea of the most important objective of art, like uh, American Marxist composer Frederick Chesky said, is for coming together. There is uh, no antidote better than, um, than uh, bringing people into, in this case, the wound and, uh, and having a shared experience. So Border Tuner yeah, happened. Uh, in November of 2019. And just to mention that we also had a very important part of legacy. So we cared about, well, what happens after this two weeks and all of this incredible uh, technology goes away? And the answer is we made a binational fund um, to support local artists to continue making cross-border art. The communities of art and, and theory and literature and activism in the region is incredibly robust. It needs support. So we tried for the project not to be just a UFO that landed in the area and then disappeared without a legacy. That's why we created that fund, as well as other things that we can talk about in the, in the discussion, if you guys want. The last thing, if I'm not running out of time, um, please let me know is uh, we made this project, which is um, a pulse sensing station. So those uh, metal plates that you see there are starting to record my heartbeat. That little light that you see there is my heartbeat. And I'm in El Paso in this film. And at the same time, on the other side of the border, in the Mexican side, there is a station that is identical. And I'm waiting for someone on the Mexican side to touch the same interface. So as soon as that person puts their hands on their sensor, we see that little light, that second light lights up, and then we see um, their heartbeat beating in that second light. But what's important is that the plates themselves have a vibrator underneath, so you're actually feeling the heartbeat of the person on the other side of the border. So um, despite the fact that the bridges of light were very successful, this project seemed to touch people um, very much because um, it felt like you were sharing a humanity. You're basically putting your your hands right on their chest, and so we saw a lot of um, of um, of impact from this symbolic artwork. You don't know who's on the other side. You just know uh, and feel what their heartbeat is like. Um, this artwork we donated it, and it will be installed permanently in El Paso and Juarez, so that at any given time, you can go to the plaza and feel the heartbeat of somebody on the other side. So this is called Remote uh, Pulse. And uh, 
that's uh, that's it for my presentation. I don't know how. Thank I you, that Raphael. Time. That was um, wonderful to see that crossing the border and that that connection. I think that your your work is going to push our conversation to keep thinking about how is it not just voices but also participation. You've given a, a structure for particip participating, um, and I think that that's a uh, an increasingly important thing as we bring documentary and narrative to place that people want to do, um, not just after they, they watch, but perhaps while they're watching. Um, so the kind of real timeness of participation, I think is, is going to, it is a, a real push. And I think it ties into Shay's work as well. Why don't we turn to you, Shay, and hear a little bit about some of the projects you've been working on. Yes, thank you. Wow, so inspiring. Everyone's so inspiring. This is amazing work. Um, yeah, again, Shay Rivera Rios, they, them pronouns based in Narragansett, Wampanoag land, but I'm originally Taino, Boricua, mixed person from the island, Puerto Rico, Borican. And, you know, a lot of my work has been very local in Providence, especially recently, and I wanted to share this particular project that I'm uh, in relationship with many other artists um, realized is realizing this vision for our city, Providence, um, as a place where we can rethink public safety, especially through the lens of public health. So let me share here. All right. Can you see my screen? All good? Yeah, perfect. So this is Moral Docs. It's a transmedia story that reimagines public safety as a public health issue. Um, and I just wanted to share a few pieces of this work. It is a body of work that uh, my colleague uh, Varek Kumba is the lead writer. He's co-director with myself in this project. And we really started envisioning this work last year. It really came out of our own community organizing in our neighborhoods um, to really respond to the murder of Black people in this country and also the call to defund police and to nourish and replenish and reinvest in our communities. Um, so really around this issue. We did around six co large community forums where um, we spoke about, you know, just getting people to feel comfortable to rethink. There are some beautiful possibilities if we rethink the allocations of city budgets into community resourcing. And we did this in collaboration with city council people, other organizations and grassroots folks. So yeah, the Moral Documents or Moral Docs is a transmedia project and investigates these issues, public safety and public health. This is the team of artists. You can't talk about this kind of work um, without putting faces of the people involved. Um, we have everything from health justice consultant, community organizers, actors, poets, um, visionary filmmakers, sound folks, musicians, animators, just about 20 people came together to work on this with Vatican and I and give it life. Um, so why moral docs? Really, that idea came out of Vatic and Vatic was channeling, this quote is attributed to um, Dr. Martin Luther King and this idea that a budget is a moral document. So the ways in which we acquire, invest and use our resources is a question of moral significance. It's a moral statement of priorities, whether it's a budget that we create as an individual, as a family or as a city or as a nation. So it really says a lot about what we care about in our city. And this project, what we wanted to do, there were so many ideas and so many stories that the community was sharing with us and incredible work that grassroots orgs have been doing in Providence for years that we wanted to use art as the catalyst to highlight this really in connection with some of the things that Lafayette shared about, can we really think beyond the problem and envision what it would be to have a radical, beautiful future where our communities are nourished? So we started from that point on. And this is um, some of the works. This is a small, this is a digital altar that as artists we created when we were engaging in the work because it's not, I, I'm a firm believer that the work is not just what you put out there with the community. It's an internal container building of creating healthy and beautiful relationships where you have the support you need in order to carry community stories with trust and respect. Um, so yeah. You know, like James Baldwin said, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. That's why it resonates so much with the projects that we're showing here, because we are time bending. We are 
um, bending elements, we're bending time, we are avatars, right? Everything exists together and we're connecting with our ancestors and our past and trying to embody our present so we can digest and make sense of everything so we, we can create futures together. So, you know, this project, it really makes a case of public safety as a public health issue because um, the, what we've been trying to, to speak to is how our cells and our systems and our bodies really are impacted by racism, you know, and that this is a very real um, issue in the society. It's not just defunding the police, it's not just rethinking public services in that way, but that really has a very direct impact on people of color, on black and indigenous folks, and especially black women. And there's scientific, there's so much data that supports that. It is real. So why can't we use that to reinvest and reimagine the ways in we build our cities, our rural lands, and our community, our communities? So the, the change starts at a cellular level. And we're playing with those thoughts. You know, local artist Julio Berroa, Dominican, um, crafted these really beautiful, this is our time machine. So you get into this car that takes you into a vision of Providence in 2040. These are some of the images we wanted to really show. It's like working class car covered with flora and fauna, Jurassic Park style. Like we're gonna be, it's a gift um, from our descendants in the future to help us get to that future and see what they've created. So the project starts with the car, the time machine and the moon and the galaxy, you get in and you listen to the music created by your local artists. And then this time chariot travels the galaxies and gets to earth to the temple of music. Uh, so the temple of music is a structure here in Roger Williams Park in Providence where there's a lot of community gatherings, a lot of celebrations, a lot of plays. And we picked that as the stage because it felt you know, idyllic and celebratory. So these are some of the images of the filming. It's a VR uh, film. So the story is that there's this new generation of health justice cadets um, that are graduating into the first class of health justice. So we were living in a city where we no longer have oppressive systems from a city level. We're now looking for health justice and more um, community care resourcing and departments. Um, so these cadets are all part of different departments that we designed speculative, speculatively, um, particularly Vatic and Victoria, our health justice consultant. And yeah, these are incredible actors and actresses um, from our local community, Jackie Davis, uh, Becky Bass, Shafani Terrell. Yeah, some of the photos of us having fun on Temple of Music, really bringing this vision together. It was hard, but it was so wonderful to be in this ritual space. Something that I wanted to uplift is that, you know, the transcending mediums, you know, and art as a catalyst for this change, you know, it, I believe that art is a container for healing and for ritual. And that, you know, when we're talking about all these hard things, especially looking at hard data that's been obscured and made inaccessible on purpose to keep our communities away from having voice and resources, just how art can be the vessel to speak to this in a different way, connect emotionally to people like Rafael's work, um, that such beautiful work as well, like connecting through the heart. And that's what we hope to do. Like, I don't believe at this point, I've been an artist for a long time and I think people of color are just born artists, but you know, it's like, I, my hope for all of us is to always do work with intention because if you don't craft that intentionality, then you can become and your work can become co-opted toward, uh, toward other agendas that are doing the opposite of what you wanna achieve. So, and then, you know, resonate so deeply with Carla's work with the young people. Like it's so important to create these art spaces of intergenerational connection. So we're hoping to do that. We added animation. So it's like have a bunch of like really cool, they jump into the cadets jump into their, their simulation. So they put their glasses on and we see animations of them. There's also two key community stories. One of them is based on a fire, a house fire incident. Um, one of our community members, we interviewed them and like used their story with their consent and their guidance to build the story about how the house was on fire and how the fire department responded, but it was actually the community who supported them. Um, so we did that. And then a second, oh, Maria Fong did all these incredible um, paper sculpture animation stop motion. And then I did some of the, the digital work. 
So we've been all collaborating and pitching in. Um, yeah, we also have been involved with the City of Providence. Um, this project is part of a multi-tier strategy of the city. So they commissioned um, and contracted financial strategists to analyze the public safety budget. So we've been using, we, the artists, have been using some of that data um, with our advisors, especially the Providence student, um, uh, the Providence student movement, who have been doing a lot of this work for a long time, um, and taking a lot of the data and also visualizing it. So within the story, there's an AI that speaks, uh, the main character is Viola. Viola has Gladys, who is the AI interface, and Gladys pops up all these imagery of what was the data like in Providence? How was the police actually using their time? Like what, you know, that kind of stuff to like showcase and make data accessible. And yeah, these are our partners. So again, we were, uh, the city saw the amazing work that artists have been doing for a while in response and holding space for our community and the Department of Art, Culture and Tourism and the Healthy Communities Office um, approached uh, us, myself and Vatic Kumba to lead like a second phase of it and really turn it into an arts facilitation process. And to that, I wanna say there's a, you know, a burgeoning arts facilitation movement because people are understanding the role and the importance that artists have in holding community and civic space, especially in urban planning. As we saw Lafayette, all your work is embedded with art because you're an artist too. And you know, Vatic, Vatic Kumba is truly one of the, the leaders, I would say, in Providence of really shaping what art facilitation looks like. And really just, you know, we're all doing amazing work because we love our city and we love our people and we know there are resources out there and they should be using, we should be using them to craft the futures that we need and that we want. That's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, that you've raised such a number of great provocations that will, I think, be coming back to, uh, including this notion of arts as uh, facilitation, which implies this kind of ongoing process um, for the community. I think that um, to kind of come back across projects and open up the conversation, I'd be, I think maybe we should try and define this term community a little bit more. Um, some, in some ways, uh, terms like community can be great because lots of people mean different things by it and it can let them talk about what they mean by community. On the other hand, it can also be kind of a cover um, where people say, oh, I'm doing work with the community. And if, well, which community are you talking about? Um, and do they, do they actually have uh, not just individual voices, but is there a collective voice of the community that can push back? Uh, what's a strong community? Um, so I, I, I'd like to just open it up to our panelists to, to reflect a little on when you think about community, um, what's your emphasis? Uh, we don't need like academic definitions. We don't need to define community in any perfect way, but a, a kind of tension or relationship. For, for example, do you use community uh, as as a way to think about your audience is that is that community a, a, as audience is this, is this community as input is it community as so so t give us a sense of, of how you think about community with that as, as our focus um, anyone want to jump in community to you I can take a stab it's a question that I've been I think especially in the midst of the pandemic wrestling with and I feel like it is community is this like weird tension between like people and places and things and proximity, but then also in affinity and like collective narrative. And because so many people have a bunch of different community narratives and identity narratives, it's just constantly changing. Um, it is a tension as because I as an urban planner, everything I do tends to be place-based or like is often place-based, but also identity-based. And so it is not physical. And I don't know if that's, that's not an answer. It is more, this is just what I've been ruminating. It's like, how do you hold the tension of the physical and the ideological and community of choice versus like community of like geography and biology and whatnot? Great. I asked to piggyback off of um, what Lafayette was saying. A lot of times when I'm 
trying to figure out which communities I want to help document their stories, um, I'll go from back to, you know, segregation where these communities where Black people are the majority, but now those are changing so much. Families are migrating, people are moving away. So that sense of using like a geographic location for a community, I've had to expand because I still want to include stories of people who have moved to California, but maybe were raised in a certain neighborhood. So um, over time, I've learned to expand that the general definition um, to go just beyond geographic borders. And it's so expansive, especially now, like you're saying during COVID, it's now that virtual community that I'm finding as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's super important. It's something that in my work is very, very, very present. Like, I mean, I've been doing socially engaged work. I didn't have the language for that, but I think probably we, you know, many of us have been doing that work for a long time. And it's cool that there's a, a name for it now. But you can't say community without a power analysis of what you really mean, you know? And most of that becomes clearer when you're in civic spaces, right? Because when you, you want there, de depending on the project that you're crafting, your goal is to support and uplift a certain group of people. You define that group of people, they define you maybe, you know, maybe they're the ones telling you. And it's like usually for me, residents and residents of color or low income communities, working class folks. And I've definitely had experiences where, you know, people are throwing around the word community, but so in order to force myself or my colleagues to include real estate developers, corporations, like people with power, you know? And it's like, well, they have access in, in tons of ways. That's the problem. So when I use the term community, I define it locally, residents, like black and brown indigenous folks, queer, trans people. Like, I think naming is super important. And, you know, not that I hate the word, I hate the word, the word is, is great and is useful for grounding, but it's also helpful to define really clearly because it keeps the goals of what you're doing um, clear and it helps you keep accountable. Cause like ultimately with socially engaged projects, you know, the hope is that we're doing this work in service to community, not for ourselves not to extract and replicate, you know, systems of oppression. And I think that's one of the most powerful tools that art can bring. Like there's a lot of perceptions of art being elit elitist. Absolutely, it has been and it can be, and it can be oppressive, but it can also be so transformational and so beautiful and so intimate and how wonderful to be able to use it that way. I feel like we'll come back to this question of defining community. Um, and in some ways, it, each project might do some of that defining on its own. Shay, I loved what you were saying about the defining is actually part of the process. Um, similarly, Carla mentioned uh, that part of her process includes some of this design thinking, which comes, I think, a, a little bit more historically from uh, designing things or designing services. Even the notion of design versus filmmaking uh, is an interesting kind of tension. Um, urban designers, urban planners, um, also the, the, what's the object that we're, that we're making here? And I think there was such a, a richness in different objects that were made, but also again, structures of, of, of participation. Another way to try and define community, which I want to ask as a question, um, is some of the, what are indicators of a stronger community? And this could be you know, after you, your project is done, can you point to some way in which the community is stronger as a community? Um, did, did anyone want to jump in on that? Uh, indicators for you, especially tied to your projects. I can just mention a couple of things about the word community. Um, I think working in the borderlands, um, the, the word community some, sometimes seems a little bit limited, right? Because you're dealing with extremely complex migrations, uh, policing, um, geopolitics. I mean, it really is the future of the world is represented right in those tensions of that asymmetry to power. Um, but what I have noticed is, it, is easy to define what the community is, but you can see it emerge. So one of the things that we noticed in, in, in the project is that 
you needed to make an effort to ensure that this was representative of that cross section of different people who live in the borderlands. And you can't make assumptions, you can't make generalizations. Sometimes the word community, especially when applied to the borderlands, is a simplification that tries to, you know, sort of continue the domination that takes place alongside this, uh, this division. Um, the moment that you um, that you make it complex and people feel that they can embody that complexity, um, that's that's super powerful because then the connectivity can happen a little bit more effectively. I think that in the end, the legacy of a project like what we did is that those dialogues established relationships between people. And call me naive, but I think that those relationships are what make, um, you know, it's 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 why the word community is the big enemy is capitalism, for example, because you know once you have people talking to each other, they empower themselves. They 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 step out of the narratives of fear that keep us in a in a situation of domination. So I I want to say that these projects for me the most important thing is that they're out of control. That there is nothing that I'm saying censoring, moderating, or controlling because. As an, as an artist who lives in a privilege, I arrived at the area to listen and to learn. And that's what the project was. It's a platform for people to self-represent and for, it, for whatever is going to happen, to happen. And I think that that's an important thing, especially with relation to what Shay was saying about you know, the, the, the sort of art as elitism. Uh, a lot of people show up um, to speak for the communities of the borderlands. And usually those people who come to speak are people in privilege, such as myself. A lot of artists come in, they take a photo and then they leave. Um, but I think that the most important thing is just to make sure that this is a book or a platform that is open for others to take over. And I think that that's uh, one way to approach um, legacy, make sure that they take ownership of it and that they see themselves represented in the project. It's activated by them. The, the notion of taking over uh, and kind of having other people have voice or be empowered is, is so quickly invoked. Um, and all of us, I think, have struggled with the challenge of making that real and, and feasible. Um, maybe one way to bring it back to our the projects we've been talking about um, is that all of the opportunities to engage are mediated by technology in some way, or, or we've often been, been bringing technologies in in some way. Um, even thinking of paper as a kind of technology and medium uh, when you put up a poster, um, let alone lights in the sky that are coordinated uh, when, they, when they touch and open channels of communication. So um, I, I guess a, a question for you all is uh, we want, often there's a, a goal to be more participatory and open participation, but at the same time, it's not just that we want to give voice to everyone. We've heard different I've heard different constraints of that kind of hidden, and that's an interesting kind of tension. We don't want to talk about it as, as exclusion exactly, but Rafael, you mentioned, for example, funding that wasn't government funding, uh, as, as, as a, your tone implied that might be a good thing um, in terms of creating some of the space and voice. Um, we've, we've heard, heard Shay talk a little about uh, the, um, we don't necessarily need to be amplifying the real estate developers' voices uh, even further. Uh, so I, I guess the uh, question is, as you're thinking about um, inviting participation and voice, um, how have you helped focus that experience or constrain that in some way? Can anyone talk about a design decision that you've made in terms of that, that participation? I can speak to that uh, real quick um, and we'll combine it to with the other question. So in terms of impact, totally agree with Rafael. Like it's really about relationship building. Like that's really the key and the whole even goal of any project. And that people feel like they've contributed to something that is benefiting their community. Again, going to the role of facilitator. Um, and then I use design justice as my framework to practice uh, very much so. Uh, the other piece around it is make paying really close attention to our accessibility, which I think is something Carla has brought up a few times in our combos too. Um, but yes, so I will give a clear example. I am part of um, 
this other organization called Once for World, and they focus on building climate policy and doing st stakeholder engagement processes. Um, also with my colleague, Vatic. Um, and one very specific decision we made, that was a city um, contracted project. And one the very specific decision we made was to hold our processes only with residents. And when the city asked, but we also have this other layer of stakeholders. And I'm like, okay, but that requires a different conversation. Like you can hold an open house with them and you know, speak to them and also bring what was what has come out of the residents' need. But uh, you know, a project that is, it's just like if people talk about equity and inclusion, all these things, but they don't really know how to do it, you know? And it's like equity and inclusion is not just giving folks the floor and the microphone. It's like, will you actually honor what they're saying? Like, will they were will their ex lived experiences be included in decision making? So I, I'm a, a believer that it's good to have spaces of mixed um, cross sector for sure when you're building projects, but there's also spaces that need to be more intentionally crafted so people feel, you know, safe and trusted, you know, and that you, I don't know, like you can just create, yeah, create a space that is genuine with folks and really tell them like, this is how the project works, like transparently, like the other piece of that is you have to be transparent with people because also residents and community members, everyone and their mom comes over to folks in the neighborhood to ask them their opinion and ask them to do this, ask them to do that. But they have jobs, they have families, and they also probably have given their opinion a few times and nothing has happened. So I think, you know, to, to kind of like close the loop on that, there's a level of accountability that you have to the communities with which you're working, you know, or that you're a part of. It's like, in my case, I live on the South side of Providence, major Latino place. And I'm like living here with my folks, with my community. So I walk around, build community, people know me. So if I, you know, it's also, I'm not parachuting in. So that's a different context too, for folks who are working in different locations. But, you know, basically the trust and the relationship is super important and really, really understanding that if people give you trust, you're accountable that, to hold that trust with care. And if I can piggyback off that, I think also often, so like with our salon series, we intentionally made it planners and architects are like people of color, black indigenous people of color, because we were like, often these conversations become very vague, very multiracial. We don't know actually know what that means. And oftentimes these sorts of discussions are still framed in response to white supremacy. And we want to have a space where it's like, what does our identity mean and our collective and individual identity mean after white supremacy? What happened, What does it mean for us to be in community and be in conversation after anti-blackness, after homophobia, after transphobia? Um, and those sorts of discussions have to be intimate. They have to be careful. They have to be safe to imagine, to dictate, to feel hurt. Um, but at the same time, it is fully aware that like other conversations will happen and like not, all, not every space has to be open to everyone. And I think there was one of the things we realized, like there was an issue with boundaries and like not being comfortable with boundaries and there's nothing like every, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, but like being more clear and being more articulate, being more respectful and being like, this is not my space. Um, and it's okay, there will be another space in which I can be involved in this. Um, and I think the issue, especially because our work is so collaborative, we in this country in particular do not have, like our functional democracy does not create enough spaces for, for different organizations of folks. Um, and so oftentimes when there is an intentional space, it feels jarring when really there should be a bunch of different spaces for different contexts, for different amount of people, for different level of intimacy, for a different level of candor. Um, and at first it's very uncomfortable saying that, but I'm trying to get more comfortable. Like, no, we need, we are meant to, to have different spaces and different conversations and be okay with that. The, the idea of having multiple spaces um, that are separate I think is also different than how we've talked a lot about documentary and film, where we say, oh, there are multiple audiences, by which we might even mean in the theater, there are people of different backgrounds at the same time, 
which is, is more like a, we'll put them all in together. Um, and, and I feel like what you're talking about like is, is actually uh, almost more of this um, rotating across different spaces. Um, and, and I feel like we've heard that in a number of the different projects that they, there are multiple spaces that are, that are actually pretty different, different conversations that are happening. Um, so, so different coherent audiences to me is a little similar to the pivot from where everything's going to be interdisciplinary to we want to be a little bit selective and multidisciplinary. We want to respect each thing that's happening on its own, um, but, but carve out a, a little of that space. Um, I, there have been a, quest, a couple of questions coming in on the chat on, on technology, and I feel like I, I'm really glad that our conversation is focused a little bit more on the people in conversation at the beginning uh, and not, not too immediately into technology and, and app stores uh, and, and what you're using for your, your servo motor controllers. But, uh, but those things matter also. Um, so I feel like let's, let's try to talk a little about that as we're thinking about maybe um, different conversations in different places how have people thought about technology? Does your technology also change for your different places? Uh, how, have, how have folks thought about that connecting technology choices to, to different uh, audiences or sub places or sub communities? One thing that I find, especially working with augmented reality is that the technology is constantly changing. You may find an app that works great for a year and then the next year is defunct or you know they, they're sold to another company or no longer operational. So trying to almost like racing to find that next technology and also just working with a lot of developers to create my own technology has been a big part of my work. But um, what I really focus on now is that accessibility. So whatever I make, whether it's an interactive project or a VR or AR, I try to have a web-based application as well. So someone can just type on the internet and pull it up on their home computer for someone who may be more just um, less tech savvy. I've had a lot of apprehension, especially dealing with like elders in the communities who don't want to, you know, use a cell phone and, you know, the AR app and things like that. Um, so just having multiple platforms for a variety of users has been um, a way that I'm attacking that problem. I'm um, trying to think what else. Um, yeah, it, I just feel like I'm constantly racing to, to keep up to date with the, the latest technologies, but it's a fun challenge and, and working with young people absolutely helps because a lot of times they know they're born with the technology. So it's great when you have that intergenerational approach to collaborate with, yeah. Yeah, I would say that the choice of certain interfaces is critical. So a lot of the complexity of media art is an alienation for many different types of communities. We tried to create something for Border Tuner that was very intuitive, that had to do with tuning. You could see the results right away. Um, and critically, that in this particular um, piece that the technology use, which is these searchlights that typically, you know, can be associated with fascist spectacles of power, say of Albert Speer, or in the region, more importantly, is the helicopters looking for migrants at the border. These are not friendly lights. These are lights of intimidation. They're lights to blind you. They're, they're policing. And so to, to, to reuse or misuse those technologies that typically have to do with this kind of surveillance state and make them bottom up, is 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 one one way that we try to to bring a technology rather than shy away from it, bring it into the area, try to create a critical or poetic usage of those technologies, and by doing so, acknowledge the complicity um, that we have with the power structure. I'm not ever going to pretend that because we had our money was coming from philanthropy, that somehow philanthropy is neutral. I, I'm fully aware that that's not the case. But in our case, to work um, with those technologies, which is actually a violence to bring an extremely expensive show to a region that has is in dire need of support, the, the cultural communities, the activists. I mean, there is a need right now for that area to have funding. So there's something immoral of making this large show. Um, having said that, I think that we have to understand if you do the government thing, at, at least for us, 
in the governments we're dealing with two nationalistic governments i'm not interested in nationalism one and two is corporations they want to create a grand prix and as shay was saying you know you're establishing a relationship of trust with the people if you show a logo all of a sudden you betray that trust and now it's just a marketing uh, scope so i would say that even more difficult than the permits to actually shoot searchlights and microwaves across the u.s mexico border the difficult part was to try and find funding for it to actually exist as something um, viable. Um, so in in the intuition of the interface, and then I, I noticed in the chat, one more, last thing, sorry, um, a lot of people are saying, well, augmented reality is really difficult to, to get a grip on, but guys, we're at the beginning of it. It's becoming easier every time. And uh, one of the really beautiful things is that, you know, people like Carla Lafayette, like Shay, are already in the at the beginning of augmentation. So what's beautiful about this is that we, a diverse group of people, are contaminating the very, you know, genesis of this augmented reality and hopefully driving it to become inclusive and to become intuitive and to become um, open. I, I would be remiss to say that technology is inherently prejudicial, right? Like all of augmented reality or sorry, artificial intelligence and, and neural networks and so on is trained with files that are already imbued with all of our social prejudices. So there's so much work to be done before we give up and give power to artificial intelligence um, for those diversities to be represented in those training files. So I wanted to mention that also with respect to technology. No one here, in my opinion, is working with technology either as a, as a messianic force or as a novelty, or we work with technology because it's inevitable. It's how people are conducting their relationships, how countries are having war, how economy is supported. So we work in the technology to try and make some perversions of the way in which it is usually used. I, I'm saying we because that's what I gathered also from the projects presented here. But um, yeah, so technology is, is, is a language of globalization. We use it to try and, and make our mark. The idea that technology is inevitable uh, I find is an interesting provocation, um, partly because it reminds us that technology is already here. Um, it, it, those of us that are come from media studies backgrounds re remember, oh right, pencils are technology and they didn't stop becoming technology when we invented computers. We just stopped calling them technology. Uh, and in fact, cities uh, are technologies uh, as well. So the, I think that the, the sense of, of who gets to uh, be brave enough to work with technology, um, but also who has that access around technology. I, I, the invoke youth are so often invoked because we seem to think that they they will have this uh, different skills. Sometimes it's just they have a different attitude um, and not necessarily uh, different skills. Uh, so I, I wanted to bring that access question around technology as well. I think that access is really important to so many of the projects here. Um, how have you tried to broaden the access on the technology side, um, and maybe we'll, uh, Rafael, some of yours is very clear with your with your interfaces. How about those of you that are doing more digital projects? Um, how do how have you thought about accessibility? I've noticed, like when I've done some of the outdoor screenings or like the digital scavenger hunts using AR, um, sometimes there were issues with people's cell phones not having enough um, storage to download the app or just they may not have, you can't assume that everyone has data on their phone or access to Wi-Fi and things like that. So my workaround was now transitioning to using QR codes as the trigger to pull up that AR component. So a lot of the more up-to-date phones, they have that QR reader, but again, you can't assume that. Some people may have older models. So I'll, I'll usually have a backup to the backup. You know, I'll have a primary way to view the, the media, you know, if you have an up-to-date cell phone with a QR reader, if you have an older model, sometimes I'll have like iPads you can check out at the community events, you know, I'll do trainings and workshops. So trying to think about accessibility all around for any of the community events that I do. And then for those who just don't want to access with it, then we'll have the traditional screening on a you know large screen and you can just sit down and watch the different um, modules that were created for the app. So trying to think about that when I'm creating these events has been helpful. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I agree completely with the idea of data as still a, an accessibility question. Um, my lab has been doing a lot with text messaging and something that just as to build on QR codes, not even, a lot of people still don't know that you, a QR code can actually be used to pre-populate a text message. Uh, so you scan the QR code and it's just a text message, which you're still not in the data space. Um, you're still, and you could send the text message and still be in the, um, the phone plan space. Um, we, we talk a lot about Apple and Google, um, but companies like Twilio that are managing the telephony infrastructure, which is, is massive, are, are something that I feel like a lot more filmmakers should be trained in, how to put up a, a hotline where you can pay for a phone for a, a dollar a month uh, and, and have uh, ways of people being able to call and text in to participate uh, should be a more standard part of our tool set um, to Lafayette's point about the imagination and the kind of narrowing. Uh, uh, to me, a radical imagination is not forgetting the phone as a, as a, as a thing. Um, the, um, I wanted to turn our questions uh, a little to uh, one of the audience questions that came in. Uh, Ruth asked about whether film is the ultimate fallback, uh, which I think is, a, is both an accessibility question, but as we're thinking about the future of of documentary and how that that ties into some of this. Uh, even Raphael's work, which didn't uh, project video, he showed us a video. Uh, so often video emerges from these projects. Uh, they, they bleed video uh, afterward uh, in, in sometimes good ways. So I wanted to, to just have people comment on is is film for you a fallback? Is it um, is it a technique? What's your kind of relationship uh, with more traditional film? I'd say like in the moral, but also I'm learning a lot from Carla. Carla, thank you so much for sharing all that because I am actually just like a performance artist and I do multimedia stuff, but with moral docs, it's gonna be the first time that we do, you know, really thinking about how to make this accessible on multiple levels. What we've been trying to do is offer just different ways of experiencing it. So I would say maybe film is a fallback. I don't see it as a fallback. It's just one out of the many tools that we can use to tell the stories and bring them out to people in ways that, you know, they want to experience it. Um, some folks don't want to wear the, they won't want to wear the VR headset or can't because they get dizzy or, you know, it's just like trying to think about the different physical abilities that people have. And the other piece is language. I feel for me, like it's been really important to think about that. Um, definitely a few uh, of my projects have been either centered Spanish or like tried, attempted to be bilingual in, a, in spaces that are not centering Spanish. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, other indigenous languages here, there was one project that I led that, you know, there's a big uh, Guatemalan indigenous community that speaks, uh, speaks Quichua and like, that's not a written language, so it's verbal. So I, I just see like film is just one of the mediums. Audio can be another one like imagery can be another one. And then, you know, the technologies too. So moral docs, we're making it accessible via YouTube. You can just choose to view it on a browser and drag your mouse, or you can choose to like wear your glasses. And then Vatic and I are setting up a series of engagements to be in space with people, guide them, give instructions, you know, be in space with folks to help them also. Cause it's really fun to finally have access to these things too. Like, I feel like that's part of the goal. Like, it's like, we get to play, but now like, let's take it to the community and show them they can like hang out and like do VR maybe, I don't know. I mean, it's a very like limited idealistic perspective, but I'm really hopeful that um, folks will be excited that their stories will be told in these new ways or are being told in these new ways. So that's what I got. Um, for me, for a project such as Border Tuner, one of the interesting things is film, but not linear film. So um, we actually recorded 600 hours of participation at, at the piece. When you approached the microphone, it told you, you're about to make your voices public. They're going to be recorded. They're going to be archived as part of the Border Tuner archive. So people knew about this. And when they participated, that already kind of helped them. It's like, oh, OK, so I, you know, they sort of self-moderated. They knew that they were being in an event that was uh, 
archiving all of this. And all I can say about that is that I've only watched 300 hours uh, of, the, of the 600 hours. It is daunting, but it's such a pleasure, you guys, because I sit there and all of a sudden out of after 20 hours of, hey, what's your name? Como te llamas and whatever. All of a sudden somebody was gonna say, well, you know, I wanna dedicate this to my brother who passed away yesterday as he was like, and, and you just like freak out this little golden nuggets of, of, uh, of expression that came out of the film. But I think that there is the film and then there's a curation of the film and the presentation of that film as archives and as a living memory of what happened. So film is great for that kind of documentary. Uh, so long as you don't try, I mean, some people try to establish a very linear narrative, but I think in expansive projects like this, it's good to have different entry points to the film material. Yes, um, I'll add to that. With me, I started out on a traditional documentary um, platform, and I found that that was limiting where, you know, I was bring something at a film festival and I didn't see kids there watching these documentaries. So I tried to think of ways to make, make it more accessible and interactive for young people. But what I found with film in general is that I started loving to document the behind the scenes process. So how you're um, commenting, Raphael, about recording that process and that interaction, that's me is sometimes give them the most beautiful footage of filming, um, just people come together to view whatever it is that you made. And I find that more endearing and some surprising stories that come out that I couldn't have gotten otherwise. So that's becoming my favorite part. So not necessarily using traditional narrative film as the driving force, but something that you document and that becomes part of the living archive and that becomes you know, something in, in itself to document, so yeah. Yeah, and I think, I guess probably the only person who hasn't produced a doc or any sort of film. As I explore those things, I think I like to think of storytelling on the spectrum mm -hmm. or as a spectrum. Um, and that like, I don't fall back to documentary, but I also think there are other ways, like there's a visual aspect, but there's also the like um, aural aspect of it and thinking of like, how can I use music? to like tell the story and to tell a history and to document a history. How um, do I use sell, smells to document a space? Um, and I think the thing that I'm excited about, even like with augmentation and with traditional and, and like emerging doc technology is we can continue to tell multiple stories across the spectrum and engage in the full human experience, which that now the human experience is not just the physical senses, but also the digital senses and digital presence of the human being. Because um, yeah, I started off my career working with elderly people. I think, do they have access to the internet? Do they trust the internet? Is this is it better to put on the internet so that they can engage with young people? And like this is like this is how we can force this sort of engagement. Um, yeah, it is the potential for expansive and multi-sensory storytelling is just so much more, it's so exciting these days. We've reached our 10.30 hour, and, and I think that at the end of our, our time, that was a wonderful way of, of starting to bring it back uh, to, to film, which so many of us have uh, deep connections to, as well as the places that, that we've lived. And I think that the and the communities that we're a part of, the layers uh, to me has been the, the word that I keep coming away with. Uh, and I'm just so inspired by uh, the ways that uh, everyone on the panel has been uh, weaving those layers and groups together. Um, so thank you all for this conversation. I, I, if we were all in an auditorium, I think we'd all be uh, clapping for you, the uh, many participants would be as well. So it's been a real honor to have, be in this conversation with you all. Um, and uh, thank you audience for all of your questions. I tried to weave a, a bunch of them together to combine them. Uh, there were many that we couldn't get to as well who, that were excellent questions. For those, I also encourage you to be in touch with our, our panelists. Uh, and, and thank you as well to the Open Doc folks for bringing this all together and hosting this conversation. So with that, uh, thank you all.